Good afternoon, everyone. And I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Janet McKee. Janet is the president and owner of Nutritious Lifestyles, a group of 180 dietitians, dietetic technicians, CDMs, and chefs that provide nutrition and food service consultations nationally. She specializes in adult and geriatric nutrition, nutritional renal disease and pressure ulcers, and speaks nationally on nutrition for the healthcare and food industries. Janet is a born certified specialist in geriatric nutrition, as well as a diplomat with the American Professional Wound Care Association. Janet will be sharing an update on how to continue providing quality food and dining programs with food and chemical interruptions while maintaining your food budget. So today we're going to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and how it's affected food production, the dining room programs, and what are we going to do about some of these food and chemical interruptions that we're having. And what's more, how can we possibly maintain our food budgets with the rising cost of hamburger, which is about 300% more? So the current state, lots has happened since March. It's an ever-moving target, and we are moving with it. So one of the things in graduate school that was very meaningful for me was my, one of my graduate teachers told me that change is inevitable, learn to live with it. In COVID, something new comes up every day. Recently, I got a report that we do not believe that is as transmitted on plastic and surfaces that we believed at one time. So it's every day, so we have to keep on top of the situation. So we know for sure that COVID is still transmitted through respiration, air, drops of globules, uh, moisture, etc. It's altered all our lives. So currently, the current recommendations are six feet apart as a minimum and wearing masks. COVID-19, unfortunately, stopped production completely of numerous plants. So meat plants particularly, there was one, I believe, in the Northwest that was completely shut down, and it was a, a pork manufacturing slaughterhouse packing plant. It was completely closed for three weeks. 900 members of their team were sick with COVID. Therefore, they had no choice but sit, shut down, and there were many, many more that shut down as well. So our production, our processing, the labor needed to pick crops in the field, chemical production, supply and demand, all of that has been very much influenced. Additionally, in the United States, in many states, we really have a good handle on COVID. We have been very, very diligent at avoiding large outbreaks. In Orlando, I think we've done very well. However, in some Latin American countries, reports are stating that it is running rampant there. It is in affecting the ability of certain countries to export meats, for example, Brazil, fruits and vegetables, which affect us. So everything is really being affected by this situation with COVID. So there are interruptions and there are issues, and we can work through them as a team together. So as we said before, meat and poultry slaughter plants were frozen, and also vegetable and fruit processing plants were closed. However, they are reportedly mostly reopened at this point in time. However, they, due to social distancing and ill employees, reportedly they are only able to run at 70% capacity. That means that supply and demand will take effect. The way that we eat has changed. I have really not in my lifetime seen so much fast food and drive through food. There are increased demand for applesauce, fruit cups, yogurt cups, individual cans of soup, sanitizers, paper goods. All of that increased demand has caused shortages. So the projection is at this point in time, protein supplies will be compromised for quite some time. We believe that it will last through May and June and possibly beyond. Disposables in some areas are in short supplies. Chemicals too. So as supply dwindles, demand increases, increased prices. 
For example, I reviewed the invoices of multiple food purveyors recently, and ground beef in certain cases has went up 300%. So that will be budget overrides and will cause problems. Therefore, there may be budget overrides or overage, and that's something you should certainly communicate with your administrator on. So what do we do? We have to look at our budget. We have to maintain quality. And in some cases, we're short of leather, uh, labor. Therefore, we have to look at how the food looks as well. It is truly a balancing act. So currently, there's been reduced availability of fresh and frozen meats. I have got reports of chicken, fresh, reports of whole muscle beef, brisket, roast, especially, especially frozen and fresh ground beef have been very, very short in supply. Pork, pork sausages, and particularly bacon. So we have stability with seafood right now. We also have adequate frozen turkey supplies. Eggs are pretty good except for certain production houses and distribution centers that have not been able to stock and purvey these foods. Skim meal additionally has been rerouted. They're making low fat in whole milk and diverting their resources to that. And therefore, dairy has been altered. So we are forced to make substitutions in our menu and in our way that we're serving and producing food. So here are the tips on menu alternatives, because you will have to make alternatives. If you simply cannot get a roast, you may have to switch to a turkey breast. So if chicken or pork or beef are shorted, Make sure you're involved in that selection process. You can alternate protein for protein, turkey or fish if needed. You can certainly use meat extenders, shepherd's pie, bean burritos with beef, etc., cetera, um, turkey tetrazzini. And you can certainly flip and use different cuts of beef, pork, and chicken with differing cooking techniques. Remember, Tough meat needs moist, long cooking. Fresh beef products have been almost non-existent or so expensive they were unaffordable. Frozen is better sometimes. Switch to ground turkey and roast turkey if you need to do that and use competitive buying. Pork. If you need fresh pork, it's not available, try frozen. Also look at trading in chicken, turkey, and beef cuts. Chicken. Sporadic fresh chicken has been short. Therefore, you want to switch to frozen if challenged, and you can certainly substitute turkey. So one of the biggest complaints I've had in a number of our states, including Ohio, Florida, as well as Texas, have been no bacon. So pork bacon has been in short supply. So we suggest you consider trying turkey bacon, although it's not the same consistency. Pork sausages, you can certainly try tur turkey sausages, which have been very well accepted. In place of skim milk in your recipes, in drinking, use whole milk, 2% milk. Canned milk can be used in recipes, and also powdered milk. So, protein for protein. So, I have developed some exchange lists for you to see Protein equal protein equal protein. So if you look at your meats, your beef can be interchanged. Any of these are the same nutritionally than one or the other. So in other words, ground beef is going to have the same nutritional density as chip beef. So that's good. Based on the cost of the beef, you will have to competitively purchase. Think about your cooking availability and your demands of your staff and the shortages of staff and plan accordingly. So pork, same thing. Fresh ham is the same thing as canned ham. So if you can get ham, canned ham and it's affordable, certainly do it. If you have chops and you can't get those, but you can get a Boston butt and it's affordable, then do that. If you cannot get pork sausage, trade up for turkey sausage. And you can certainly make life interesting by using, if you can't get ground beef, you can use ground turkey. And you can add turkey sausage to that to give it more flavor. Veal is interchangeable. Pork and chicken 
All these can be traded amongst each other as group. Chicken equal chicken equal turkey equal ground turkey equal turkey sausage. An ounce is an ounce. Fish, one ounce of all frozen and fresh varieties. Two ounces of shrimp is about one ounce of fish. A quarter cup of tuna. A lot of people are using tuna in new casseroles. Salmon croquet, etc. Baked or fried fish is an ounce equal an ounce. Certainly, people are going to some non-meat meals at this time. They're using things like cottage cheese to make spaghetti pie. They're using ricotta cheese to make different products. Mozzarella, American Swiss. Some people are using more limit using rice and bean dishes and giving sandwiches or using bean soup products to extend their meat supply. So egg whites can be used as a source of protein. Egg, one egg equal one ounce of protein. Tofu is a product, although a lot of residents will not accept that. Hot dogs, although be careful with choking victims. Some people do not allow those. Peanut butter and dried beans are all great protein alternatives. So a half a cup of lentils, like black beans, and a half a cup of rice is going to give you the equivalent to about an ounce of So those things can be very helpful when you're devising menus. Same thing with canned, green, with canned baked beans. Black bean soup is an excellent source of protein. There are all kinds of ways to utilize inexpensive protein sources in alternates to make your recipes full and happy and be able to make an extremely pleasing plate. Right now, we have been told by the dairy companies and by our major food purveyors that skim milk is going to be short in supply. So if you were to have a resident and insisted on that, perhaps you could talk to them about using 1% milk. Low-fat buttermilk, these are all exchangeable. Evaporated milk can be used in cooking, and you can certainly use non-fat dried milk, which some of you may have in inventory. You can use yogurt as a dairy exchange. You can use whole milk, evaporated milk. All the portion sizes are listed for you. And some people are very happy to have yogurt versus a slice of bacon for breakfast. So we really should be trying to make our residents happy and querying them and asking what would you like and explaining to them there's no bacon available this week, but here's what we can do. We cannot offer pork sausage instead. Would you be open to trying a yogurt uh, smoothie or yogurt fruit plate? So right now I have gotten lots and lots and lots of concerns regarding the cost of bacon, the cost of pork, and the cost of your breakfast meats. So here's some great outside the box ideas using satisfying meatless breakfast alternatives. Eggs, hash browns, biscuits, gravy, oatmeal, lots of calories, lots of starch, very filling. Remember, breakfast for a lot of elderly people is the best meal of the day. They're alert, they're happy, they're interested, etc. A continental breakfast is a great opportunity for you to serve an early riser. Boiled eggs, fruit, muffin, yogurt, a western omelet. Using a wet, a west, an egg, lots of fruits and vegetables such as onions, peppers, home fries, and a danish. Great meal. Using an egg casserole, you can certainly use turkey sausage. Cheesy eggs, biscuits, butter grits. Fajitas, egg muffins, all these are great protein alternatives that do not contain meat. Waffles with strawberries and whipped cream, home fries, eggs, and remember that home fries are very, very inexpensive. And really, eggs are a great source of protein, but very, very inexpensive compared to a lot of meats right now. A pancake with a fruit, whipped cream, and a farmhouse omelet, cheese omelets. And a lot of these are pre-made and are still economical. Hash browns with cinnamon toast. And remember, a lot of these foods have different texture varieties. And as we age, our ability to taste declines. So it's very, very important to make the foods tasty, make them 
flavorful and plantable. Mega cinnamon rolls with lots of icing, eggs in a fruit cup, great breakfast meal. So know your population and what you can do and what you can't do. So a lot of nutritious lifestyles employees work in areas where we have a very large Latino population. So for example, in way south Texas in the valley area, it might be very, very appropriate to serve breakfast burritos with one egg per burrito, a slice of cheese, and peppers. That's very filling will really give them a lot of protein, a lot of calories. It could be wraps. It could be a sausage and bacon cups. It could be a breakfast in a casserole that uses eggs, cheese, and it can be turkey sausage, and that is keeps, keeps heat retention so well, very tasty, and will wake up their taste buds. A Latino breakfast casserole and a tortilla breakfast casserole. And again, if you were to have room trays, which most, a lot of people are, and most people are still doing room trays, these breakfast casseroles hold their retention of food. The tents are great. Remember, if they're stuck together, foods are high density, better temperature retention. So at this point in time, because of the lack of availability of meat, and cost control issues, I suggest we consider looking at using protein combination dishes. They're soft, they're economical, they're crowd pleasers, they're comfort foods, and they taste great. Most residents love lasagna, spaghetti pie, shepherd's pie, which has garden peas, mashed potatoes, a smaller amount of ground beef, a cup equals two ounces of pure meat protein, which is about 14 ounces. Egg and bread casseroles, change your menus, think outside the box. Have egg and shredded potato casserole for dinner versus having a, a pure meat protein. Chili with beans, mac and cheese, a cup of bean soup, for example, maybe soup equals an ounce of meat and it's extremely filling. A cup of rice and beans equal an ounce of meat and certainly most residents love pizza. One slice, one ounce of cheese pizza equal to an ounce of meat serving. These are very economical dishes. So when you're doing these, think comfort for your residents. This has been a difficult, COVID-19 has been very difficult for all of us, but especially them. Make sure that it's a satisfying food that's filling. It's color variety, texture variety. The texture is soft because we don't want to give them something like Frito pie that might be unplatable and they have difficulty chewing it. Good heat retention if you're using room service and reduce portion size, cost per portion. So meat has definitely been in short supply. Unfortunately, we believe that COVID will affect the future to be. In fact, we already know it is. We are unsure at this point in time the effect of COVID on spring planting. Weather, as anybody that's from a farm community knows, we cannot control the weather. But we can certainly control how much we consume and what we're going to do about that and how to think outside the box should there be shortages. Proficiency. There are several vegetable and fruit. There was an issue with making cream corn last week. So those are going to be in short supply. A lack of labor. They experience similar problems to meat packing plants. We may, as things are opening up, have some more positive cases of COVID. Social distancing affects production. If you're working in a line that's making canned green beans, you have to be six feet apart versus one foot apart. It's going to take longer to produce those same products. Again, July and August shortages are expected. So when you look at your fruits, we believe that there will be possibilities with fruit picking in the future. We also believe, for example, if you are working in the California market and there's going to be customers that are going to be wanting certain foods, such as, let's say, um, avocados. So avocados, which are a fat, actually, cannot be picked 
if we don't have the labor to do that. And so if we have to do social thing on a bus that picks up workers, we may not be able to get all the workers there in time to have a full day of picking. So we're going to have to work around that. So these are interchangeable fruits. So when you're looking at your order guide, make sure that you're very, very involved in any substitution, especially needs right now. Make sure that you work with your vendor, you pre-order way in advance, and you approve any subs. We have heard horror stories about people consuming, or excuse me, ordering ground beef, for example. They don't have it. They sub out a very expensive whole cut of meat for $8 a pound. So please, please be very involved in this process. Be involved in all your substitutions. All of these foods in this particular list are extremely interchangeable. So if you can't get fresh apricot or canned apricot, switch to something else such as in seasonal time in Florida, we are already getting cantaloupe. So all these foods are very interchangeable. Same thing here. In the near future, right now we're getting California peaches, but soon we'll be getting North Florida peaches, and we will also be getting Georgia peaches in the next few months. So these are all exchangeable foods, and remember, by seasonal. Watermelon is in season in Florida right now because we're a few months in front of some of the other states, and therefore we have that available. Again, buy what you can afford at a reasonable price, and usually seasoning is important as far as planting times and what's coming off the vine at a certain time on the tree. So consider using some of these foods as interchangeables. We had to let strawberries basically rot the fields in Florida or dry up in the field because uh, some of the farmers in Lakeland, Florida, which is about 45 minutes north of Florida, or west of Florida, of Orlando, they simply did not have a market for them. So they basically let them dry up and rot in the field. At the grocery store, you got three quarts for $5. So that's very, very inexpensive. And so you can look at that. You can look at using juice blends instead of using 100% orange juice, for example. You can use fruit cocktails. You can blend those in, and you can make that extend that cost a little bit more and manage affordability. Everybody is exceeding their vitamin and mineral needs on a menu. So if you use a orange juice blend versus 100% as vitamin C fortified, it's a great product. It's very economical, and the residents will like it. Again, when you're serving juices, think about especially asking people what they would like instead of just providing a juice and ended up coming back in the waste. So these are vegetables that are very exchangeable. Again, by the season. Right now, I've read reports that something happened in the weather, and then asparagus is going to be backlogged. So there's going to be a shortage. So if you have a recipe that calls for asparagus, you may need to change that out. So all these vegetables are inexchangeable. So a half cup serving of cooked vegetables equal the same thing as a cup of uh, raw carrots. So all these foods are inexchangeable. Again, buy and season. Generally speaking, in the wintertime, tomatoes are going to be much more expensive than the summertime. And summer squash, a lot of times fresh, is very inexpensive during this time of year. So we have also gotten lots and lots of reports from our vendor partners and our employees and our dietary managers that key foods are in short supply, but also sanitizing wipes. And in some cases, disinfectants and sanitizers. So and what we have found is it's not just one thing here or there. It's each vendor seems to be different. Remember that each vendor may have different contracts with different companies. And one company may have had one of their um, plants that produce pork completely shut down. And another plant might have been functional. So it depends on the contract your vendor has. It also depends on transportation in the area of the country. So in this respect, if you cannot get Clorox wipes and disinfectant, we can make our own. Use a homemade bleach solution, one-third cup equal to a gallon, equals 1,000 parts per million. This is a disinfectant. 
And remember, a disinfectant kills 100% of viruses and germs. So, and that is to be used in the front of the house in heavily touched areas, such as doorknobs, such as telephones, such as the dining tables, etc., such as things in the hall trays. So, one ounce of chlorine to a gallon of water equals 50 to 100 parts per million, and that will allow you to use sanitizing strips to test that out. However, the 1,000 will not test. The test strip only goes up to 200 parts per million. The sanitizer kills 99.9% .9 of germs and viruses. That is appropriate to use in the back of the house. It should be used after each piece of equipment is utilized. You want to disinfect the dining area at least before and after your meal. So if you finish your breakfast meal, you should clean the tables at 10 o'clock so they're nice and clean for the next lunch period. If you can't get chemicals for one purveyor, try the next. So Ecolast is a big player in the field and so is diversity. So go back and look in these competitive buying and bidding. So with all these shortages and we know that the costs are rising, severely in some cases. What do we need to do to control our costs? Well, first thing, we need to always make sure that you take an active role in ordering your food at least one or two days prior to the order delivery. For example, if you're anticipating a Wednesday delivery, order by Monday at 11 o'clock, so you have time to review that order, talk it over with the company if they're shorts and redirect them on what to sell. Take an active role. Discuss cost projections with your management team. So you don't want to have your cost $2 over per patient day and it hits your administrator on the P&L. Have those difficult discussions and come up with some ideas on cutting costs and sharing those with the administrator to let him know that you are really, really working on this and want to make it a good situation that we can improve quality while reducing cost. So how do we control cost? Number one, always take an inventory prior to your order. Decide on your menu. And again, that has to be very great or flexible because it may they just can't get you a certain product and you may have to change your menu. Maximize your GPOs. Use your CMAs. Use competitive buying services and opportunities. Place your order super early. Pre-approve all vendor subs. And if the product is not affordable and you don't need it, send it back. Check deliveries yourself. And again, your vendor should be bringing it at least to your back door, if not in the door, wearing a mask, and you should oversee the storage, and if the item is not necessary and it will break your budget, send it back. So you should be monitoring the tray line for production, cost, and waste. You should be looking at tray line studies when trays come back from the floor, what's the plate waste look like? We should be monitoring for portion control. If you serve an extra serving of mashed potatoes for 100 residents at lunch every day, it's a $10,000 average of stuff to eat. Use a daily spin down report for financial accountability. Track and change reports for census. If you were using a software program and you had it booked for 90 census, and your census dropped to 72, address that and change it in the computer because you're going to need less food and less production. Lock your storage room when you're not using that. Use your PPD and monitor it with the administrator. Use for food first and less costly supplements and liberalize your diet. Sugar-free, salt-free products cause increased labor, they're more expensive and the quality of food simply is not very good in some cases. So let's talk about food waste. A lot of your residents are very small people. If you have a resident that weighs 
let's say 100 pounds, and is an 85-year-old female, well, that person needs about 1,200 calories a day and only about 55 grams of protein. But yet your regular menu, excluding snacks, remember you at least get an HS snack, which could add 300 calories. You're looking at giving them with snacks 2,700 calories a day and over 100 grams of protein. A person that weighs 100 pounds, you multiply their weight times 10 to 12, and that's the number of calories for a female you get. Use their weight times 15 for a male. So if you are 100 pounds and you can only consume 1,200 calories and you're comfortable doing that and that's all you need, then chances are this is what's going to happen. Daily waste of 1,200 calories, which year after year, day after day, that's thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars that you're just not getting a good return on your investment. So we want to take our food dollars and get the best product we could possibly get for our residents to avoid negative outcomes such as weight loss, customer dissatisfaction. We want happy residents, happy survey becomes positive. So you want to review your menu and your revisions based on the food you can get in your budget. You want to keep that daily spin-down report if you see that hamburger is 300% more then you might want to adjust your recipe instead of having homemade meatballs or pre-made meatballs that are super expensive and spaghetti, you might want to switch it to tetra turkey, te turkey tetrazzini. You want to adjust your recipes in your software programs, which most people are using web-based menus at this time. You want to utilize your leftovers. Nobody's perfect. Never even using a production sheet or going to get it 100% you may have five portions left over. Adjust your recipes for your census. If you were 120 normally and since COVID you haven't been able to take admission and you're 90, you need to adjust your recipe computer system and software system for that. Look at your portion sizes. No large and doubles unless needed and especially if there is no doctor's order for that. Consider small portions. As I said before, a person that weighs 100 pounds cannot possibly consume 24 to 2,800 calories a day in day out basis, so it ends up going in the trash. That's really important, and you should work with your RD on that. So, when you're making your program, what are you going to do? You're going to look at frequency. So, if you ha cannot get ground beef, you don't want to have chicken every single solitary day. And that will happen if you're not careful. So you always need to fill out your menu substitution log and compare it to your menu. You want to look at the center of the plate and make sure it's attractive. You want to look at your food cost. What is this product going to cost me? Look and see if the residents like it. Is it colorful? Is its texture? Am I providing variety? Is the shape pleasing? And is the taste pleasing and go for the other meal products? For example, you would not want to have baked fish, steamed broccoli, and to have mashed potatoes. That would be white on white on white. Would not provide any of these issues. Not a good meal. Looks very unappetizing. So when you're making your menu changes, you want to make them as great as possible, aesthetically appealing, and you want that to increase your intake and avoid waste. This is a good time to pair those products off your menu that nobody likes. So what's also important when you're making your menu substitutions is think about the elderly, because that is primarily what we, use, we cover. I'm sure that many of you may have heard that as we age, a sad fact occurs. The olfactory bulbs, in your nose diminish. Therefore, your smell affects your appetite severely. And it is very, very, very important that when you're consuming food that you be able to smell food and see food because sight and smell influence our perception of what we're about to eat and it either stimulates or detonates your appetite. 
So we need to use aromatherapy to increase appetite, homemade bread, soup carts, bread carts, visual and looking at it. And by using inexpensive garnishing and to make the food look great, it has to taste great. So some rules. Never serve anything you would not personally eat. We eat with our eyes. I can guarantee your food intake will be higher when you have an attractive meal that's put forth in you like this meal that's on your screen. Everything on your plate should be edible. Again, a lot of elderly have pica. They chew on non-food things. You want to keep them safe. Always odd numbers. Plateware should not take away from the food. You want the food to be the center place. And simple foods can absolutely make beautiful plates. So plate presentation, look at the middle of the plate and work your way out. Make your sauce under your meat and keep the crust crispy. Reverse the front of the plate for the best looking food. So garnishing, inexpensive garnishes that are great and it doesn't have to be a lot. One orange peel will do. A few berries, a very small, very small, minute sliver of a cantaloupe. Parsley flakes, pickles, peppers, fruit wedges, like an apple wedge, but of course not on a puree diet. So lemon with fish, parmesan with pasta, onions and tomatoes, and a lot of people absolutely love having chopped onions in the garbage. So it depends on your population understanding what they want. So as we age, our affinity, our ability to taste salt declines. Because remember, those olfactory buds in your nose die or become less efficient. Also, the taste you consume and taste butter of bitter is also declining. 99% of the elderly love and can taste sweets. Desserts can be a wonderful way to impact up in calories in and bring absolute joy to a resident. Garnishes like mint, berries, chocolate sauce. There are many, many angles here that you can provide. So, for example, a sheet cake, poke a few holes in it and put some pineapple juice in it and put whipped topping on it is a great way to get calories in a resident. So, again, appetite retardants are part of the aging process. Again, your taste and sense declines with age. A lot of people that Nursing facilities and assisted living can be taken 15 medications at a time. They get bored very easily, their olfactory buds decline, and their ability to taste simply goes down. So what do we need to do? Well, number one, we need to wake up those taste buds. Adding extra flavor enhancers such as powdered milk, canned milk makes a rich mashed potato, half and half, using MSG where appropriate to spice up or enhance the flavor of your meats and products, using spices, red peppers, adobo, uh, rosemary, thyme, cinnamon, lorenta, oregano, basil, cumin, and curry, or just a few spices that are out there, using cream to make mashed potatoes, using whole cream to make grits. Gravy, sausage, extra butters, using flavorful fruits and combinations with vegetables, carrots and raisins, using garlic and chicken to bake off a chicken, pan-seared meats. pan theory quickly seizes the flavor and wraps it in the food. Roasted vegetables, tomatoes, etc., and fruits add a lot of flavor variety. Caramelized onions, horseradish is a very severe taste. And actually, salsa is loved by many residents. So, as we're going along and COVID has taken care or taken a foothold in our facilities, we have come to believe and know that hydration is very, very important. Hydration keeps people from getting sick. Hydration is needed because elderly people are very prone to getting dehydrated, getting UTIs, decreased mobility, a lot of that can have to do with insufficient fluid intakes. Use a variety of mixed options such as fruit punch and lemonade. These are very expensive. 
So don't feel compelled to use orange juice at every meal of large containers like this because it will be very cost prohibitive. So some of the things people are housed in their rooms, there may even be some restricted moving about. And therefore what we're suggesting is that you make snack time a facility time. That you use creative, cost-effective ideas to avoid food boredom and suggest simple, easy, cost-effective snacks. For example, it takes less than 20 minutes to make a huge brownie sheet. The brownies are cut. Who doesn't like sweets? There are many of us that love sweets. Homemade Rice Krispie Treats. Again, you mix it up with a bowl. You melt the mash, um, marshmallows and butter. You whip it up. Homemade coffee cake, blueberry chip, chocolate chip, cornbread muffins, vanilla wafers, orange oatmeal cream cookies, banana, peanut butter cookies, cheese, peanut butter, all kinds of crackers, homemade frosty cake. You can make a chocolate cake and make a vanilla icing in less than an hour and have serve 50 desserts from it. Nutty Buddies, ice cream bars, ginger bread cookie, chocolate chip cookies, peanut butter jelly sandwiches. And again, you want to be careful not to serve that to a dependent diner without supervision. And you also want to make sure they're not a choking risk. Ch cottage cheese and fruit leftover. Homemade cobblers or even fresh made cobblers or leftover desserts. Pudding with toppings. These are great ways to keep your residents happy and have snacks between meals and to have variety cost effectively. So a great idea during this time where families are really, really feeling concerned because they can't see their residents, it is a fabulous thing for the administrator to take the Carter desserts around and Photoshop and take pictures and post them of what they're doing for marketing to keep our residents happy and also just to show goodwill and to make our residents feel so pleased that the administrator or CDM was concerned enough to take them a dessert under the proper sanitation guidelines and say, hey, how are you doing? So that has worked very, very well for us in the past, and it's especially a great time to do this. So we understand how busy everyone is, and we have created a snack menu that's cost effective that will allow us to have a cost control three times a day snack menu, and this is uh, certainly you can download this and use it yourself, but you'll see lots of fruit punches and fruit drinks because it's just not necessary to provide expensive juices because they're getting plenty of nutrients in those three meals a day. Here's our sample snack policy, and we certainly do use leftover pies and cakes and things of that nature. We do use those for snacks even now. So. Again, how do you control costs, seasonal produce, using canned items when appropriate. A couple of nights ago, I made green beans, canned um, cream of mushroom soup for French onion rings, and I know that it didn't cost very much because it served enough for the entire family with leftover. I think the beans were 69 cents a can. I used a very small portion of onion rings, so I think that entire eight-place serving was less than $2. Consider those juice blends. Use inexpensive hydration beverages in bulk. Juice in bulk it back in the box in the back. I'm sorry, back in the box. Using meat and meat starchy egg casseroles, unique extenders such as rice and beans. Use rice and bean and bean soups. If cost-effective substitutions are not available through your food vendor, Alter your menu and call your dietitian or email them. Have them approve your substitutions and work with you on a weekly basis. Here's a sample form. Feel free to use that form. We're more than happy to have you use it. Additionally, the RD should really sign those menu substitutions. Everybody is you emailing nowadays and many people working remotely. And it's always a great idea to call the dietitian and ask for feedback on menu substitutions. 
Here's some cost-effective, convenient ideas that we are presenting to you for consideration in altering your menus. So one thing would be if you had on your original menu chicken breast all orange with a fresh chicken breast, a fresh tomato salad, greens, very labor intensive, butter noodles, garlic bread, and lemon meringue pie, which would be expensive. You could easily change for the same nutritional value, turkey tetrazine, canned green beans with pimento, garlic bread, and it's easy enough to make a blueberry cobbler or crisp using a number 10 can of blueberry filling, cobbler, top, or crisp top. It takes less than 30 minutes to mix it together and 30 minutes to bake it in your set. You can also use that leftover for your snack card. If you have on your original menu pork loin with fresh apple rings, again, labor intensive, baked potatoes from scratch with sour cream, labor intensive, steamed broccoli florets, again, can be more costly than some other products, homemade biscuits and apple pie, which again is expensive. You could easily convert that meal to black bean soup in a cup and make a sandwich or like a croissant or sandwich on a sub or bread, one ounce of ham and cheese, steamed broccoli and a mega chocolate chip cookie that can be made or baked off. It's great to bake them off. They're easy. They're in rolls or pots. Easy peasy to make it and it smells wonderful to stimulate those elderly people their appetites need that stimulation. So another example would be if you could not get roast pork and you had green beans, almonds, honey, and those are intensive because you have to uh, crisp off the little almonds. In baked potatoes from scratch, you have to pinpoint the baked potatoes so it doesn't blow up in the microwave and or if you cook it in the oven, you still, it's best practices to open the spot of sprint for the steam. Butter biscuit, iced chocolate cake, if it's pre-made, it's going to be very expensive with, with topping. So you could change that to baked turkey breast with gravy, frozen green beans, and mashed sweet potatoes, which you could take a number 10 can of yams and whip them up and you can melt marshmallows on the top and they will love them. Butter biscuits and chocolate sheet brownies are a great alternative, cost effective, and labor less so, less labor intensiveness. Use combination and variety dishes several times a week to increase appetite and reduce protein costs. For example, honey covered ham, Baked sweet potatoes with brown sugar, steamed green beans, corn muffins, lemon meringue pie. That could be a labor-intensive and somewhat costly meal. But what about spaghetti pie? You boil the noodles, you make a shell, you put cottage cheese in it, you put hamburger and spaghetti sauce together. It's a huge pie, very filling. Residents absolutely love it. Steamed green beans, garlic bread, and brownie squares. Great meal, not a lot of labor production, and again, this food will keep its temp if you're sending it down to the unit. Chicken parmesan with a fresh chicken breast, broccoli, butter noodles, garden bread, apple crisps can easily be changed for shepherd's pie using ground beef, a small amount, mashed potatoes, garden peas, and again, topping it with cheese. Garlic bread and apple crisps or apple cobbler, which you can use canned, number 10, apple filling, make a great crisp. So a sample menu that might work in certain areas of the country for you if you made meat like meat, brown beef is very expensive, tall salad, labor expensive, butter rice, biscuits, and oatmeal raisin cookies. You can easily change that for your resident population, particularly if you're in certain pockets such as the Valley, a bean and cheese chicken burrito using a half a cup of black beans, an ounce of cheese, salsa, and one ounce of chicken. You've got three ounces of pure protein consideration there with butter rice and an oatmeal cookie, and I believe that the residents would truly like this and would be easy enough for you to do. Labor shortages may, unfortunately, make it very difficult 
for us to produce food, period. We don't know the extent of this. It's better to be safe than sorry. So reach out to your food provider or nutritious lifestyle and ask for a convenience menu. Many of them have breakfast pop-up menus. We simply, simply do not know the future. I know this, that COVID is not over until we get a vaccine and we can control it, but we cannot stop it. And we know there will be at some point restrictions on production and transport. We don't know how it's going to shape out. Some of it is out of the United States control because if we're getting orange juice from different countries and we're not able to get it due to their problems or something from China, it will cause shortages and increased food costs. Currently, I'd like to share with you that Nutritious Lifestyle is currently hiring multiple positions. We love to have people on our three divisions. We have an interim floating division that we have several national contracts with PRN positions that are traveling. We have our permanent division, which we have positions in Del Rio and Eagle Pass, Texas, Lubbock, El Paso, McAllen, and San Antonio have PRN RDs in available positions. And we really need that special full-time registered technician. And we will take people that are not registered yet. They have finished their four-year degree. So pass the word. We are, are able to pay a very nice bonus. If you're not interested in provide us with a referral for a successful hire, we would love to pay you that referral bonus email resumes and emails of leads to Wendy and she'll follow up with you on the slide. I would like to thank you and some of you may would like to have the substitution sheet for the RD signature or the exchange list. If so, reach out to Michelle Mabry. And if any of you are needing some help with food cost evaluation, menu development or RD services, please call us at 877-894-0401 or email Michelle Mabry at michelle.mabry at nutritiouslifestyles.com.